Blah, blah, blah. Been there, done that. Wow. Oh, my gosh. I'm really pleased at that. How hey, did tired out takes are just me saying stupid things? Well, it's only a question of time, Jonathan. I was so naive and innocent then. Oh, yeah. That was why I was late. Fair enough. We tried to shoot for an hour. Came for an hour, surrender after two and a half. You learned nothing. How do you know that you've met an extroverted translator? I was afraid you're going to ask that. <laughs> they stayed at your shoes during the conversation? Yeah, you're right. I have so many things in my house that do not spark joy. So, what do you think? Should we give it a try? Stop the presses. Oh, sorry, I'll do this again. <laughs> that came out a little differently than I meant. But you know what I mean. Listen, guys, it's going to be major. This is going to be amazing. I decided to give myself the introduction because, you know, if someone's going to be embarrassed, I might as well be the Scotsman. Welcome to Troublesome Terps, a podcast about things that keep interpreters up at night. And welcome to Speaking of Translation. Hold on, is this Troublesome Terps or Speaking of Translation? Yes. 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 Okay, we'll go with that. Jonathan, do you want to start again? Sure. Hello there and welcome to this very special episode of Troublesome Terps, a podcast about things that keep interpreters up at night and speaking of translation. Yesterday is another fun joint podcast episode where two teams of podcasters take turns trying to figure out who's interviewing him. And on this very special joint episode we have, you heard him earlier, he's the voice of reason, the Earl of Editing, and the master of making us sound professional. Good luck with that. Alexander Drexel. Good evening, uh, everyone. I have so much practice with making you sound professional. It's, it's almost second nature by now. <laughs> That's why I'm worried. <laughs> and for team speaking of translation, we have the president of the American Translators Association, a French to English translator from Boulder, Colorado, Corinne McKay. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for inviting us to do this joint episode. We're really excited about it. It's going to be great fun. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I am worried about how honest we're going to get later. <laughs> Completing our troublesome Terps trio, you all know who he is. He is our permanent president of Pithy Points, Alexander Gansmeyer. Hey guys, so it's always curious with these sort of interview episodes, like you'd never know how things are going to go, so I'm quite <laughs> excited. <laughs> excited and scared, that's what I'm feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rounding out the incredible award-winning, speaking of translation team, we have ATA certified French to English translator, director of the board, director on the board of the American Translators Association, and author of the book Maintaining Your Second Language, Yves Baudet. Thank you. And I'm excited to be here, too, as we do this joint episode. Hello, everyone. And hello to all of our listeners. And I wanted to to welcome the both of you as well. I'm not really sure how the whole idea started for this joint um, episode, but there seems to be kind of a, a connection between the two podcasts, because I think last year you did an Ask Us Anything episode just a couple of days or weeks before we did an Ask Us Anything episode. So <laughs> I figure right. there must yeah, be some right. kind of connection. We, we need to have you you two on on the show. For quite a f- few years ago, I was on the speak. I was at the Speaking of Translation podcast. I think I was talking about being a dad. A dad, that was right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I was so naive and innocent then. I think I only <laughs> younger in life is so much easier. <laughs> no, no. We've been doing it, it since two thousand eight. So if you've been having kids after since after that, then you know. <laughs> right. I was just going to ask about that. So you've been doing this for over ten years now. Since two thousand eight. Uh huh. Wow. Wow, that's intense. Yeah, you must have been the very first podcast in the language industry. That's what I think. So we can give you the story briefly on that, and our listeners might have heard this sure, before too. Sure, absolutely. Is that um, I was obsessed with listening to podcasts at the time, and well, I still am, but, and I was looking, I wanted something on translation, and I kept looking and looking, and there wasn't anything. So then I called Corinne up, and I'm like, I have this idea for us. We're going to start this a podcast on translation. <laughs> so we're the first one that we know about. I mean, and, and, I, and it was a while before anybody else came on the scene for translation, so. That is pretty mm-hmm. awesome. So, Corinne, when you got the call, you were like totally on board or? <laughs> What's a podcast? <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh. So, the, no, I mean, I think, um, you know, I'm kind of an audio junkie um, also. Like I often say, you know, one of the only things that being a translator, which is a job that I love, has kind of ruined for me is it sort of has made me see reading as a largely paid activity. Mm-hmm. And so I don't 
read that much for pleasure anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I listen to a lot of, of audio for pleasure. And I think, I mean, you ha- guys have probably sensed that one of the um, best and worst things about Eve's and my close friendship is that rather than talking each other off of the, you know, ambitious ledge, we egg each other on like, <laughs> this is going to be huge. Oh my God, this is a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> right. Rather, right. Exactly. When we approach each other with new ideas, which happens like several times a week, that rather than the other person saying, well, you know, I like the idea overall, but maybe here are some things you should think through that we're both immediately like, this is going to be enormous. <laughs> so, so when, and we were right. We were right with the bigger, podcast. One of it's well, enormous. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> bigger, bigger than any of our other previous big ideas um we even have business cards for the podcast so yeah (laughs) that's pretty massive i I am really amazed because i had no idea and and when i think back i mean i already listened to podcasts in 2008 but overall i think nobody knew what podcasts are so i I was such a trendsetter i feel so absolutely um, (laughs) absolutely (laughs) pretty new thing you know idea and we recorded the first few episodes i mean we honestly we were pretty ad hoc um, at first, we didn't really have any sort of schedule or anything. Mm-hmm. And we recorded it um, in person. I would go to Eve's house and we would record it with a little snowball microphone um, on Mac. her desk. And she would, yeah, on her Mac. Um, and uh, yeah, and then it's kind of evolved over the years. We did some interviews at ATA conferences. And I guess it's only within like the past two years or so that we've gotten a little more organized and we try to do an episode every month. And yeah, you know, we were, like we were semi consistent, but now we do it every month. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it took us yep. a while to get on the on the monthly schedules too. I'm impressed with Jonathan because for us, maybe it was because our kids were little then too, and so we couldn't commit to doing it so consistently. <laughs> right. Exactly. We, we, yeah, we exactly. force him to. You know, that's, yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. I think the two Germans are kind of saving the whole scheduling thing. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. yes. Totally. Yeah. And yeah. there have been episodes where I've kind of called in a little bit late because someone had need, has needed to go to bed. Yeah, um, although the latest I've ever been is there was one episode where I thought, this is going to be perfect. I'm traveling anyway. I've got the hotel room to myself. We're going to be completely silent. I don't need to worry about waking anyone up. <laughs> and then everything ran late and we had Matthew Perry on. Mm, and I turned up, what, about 40 minutes late because just nothing worked. Yeah, <laughs> And I thought, this is horrible. The one time when I can impress the Germans with my timeliness. See. I didn't. There you <laughs> go. And yet, through the magic of editing, we made it all work. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, right. and I, and I think I came in, said something stupid, and then went quiet for 20 minutes. <laughs> but um, since I'm always interested in, in sort of origin stories, so did, did you two, Corinne and Eve, did you also start out in the profession together then? Did you did you even study together? Or what, what was your sort of path into into the translation business? Well, since we're going backwards in time, and I go, I'm older than Corinne, <laughs> and I, I'll start first with that. I kind of knew what translation was, but it was on the peripheral, and this was long before I met Corinne. And so I said, like, like I kind of knew like tr- what translation was, like an educated civilian might, you know? But when I was in college, because I think I'm older than all you guys, um, in the U.S., there were only a few programs of TNI, and I wasn't even aware of them. So Mm -hmm. I had studied French and international relations, um, and I have always my story I like to tell is that in college, people would say, oh, well, with a French background, what are you going to do? You're going to be a teacher. And I remember thinking, no, no, I'm not, but I don't know what I'm going to do, but that's not it. I mean, which French teachers are awesome. My kids have awesome French teachers, but I wasn't that interested in that. So um, so that was what was kind of being, you know, if you're a French major at that time, that was being put. So, so when I moved to Colorado about 20 years ago, I wanted to work in something international and I got hired on as a translation recruiter and I worked at a localization company in Boulder and that worked out super well because I really liked the industry. I got to know a ton of translators in my work um, and I still know a lot of them today, a couple decades later. (laughs) So um, what was neat about that was that I was introduced to all aspects of the industry and it was a super great learning experience. And so here I am today, been involved in the industry ever since, and I've been active in our local translators association as well as the ATA um, in the years that have followed. And I've always felt it's really important to, um, you know, kind of support the profession at the same time. So I'll let Corinne um, add what she wants to add. <laughs> yeah. So um, our Eve's and my origin story is um, I had a baby in September of 2002. 
and or I had my first baby then, then Eve had her first baby in October of 2002, but we didn't know each other um, until about, I don't know, two months after that, between two and three months after that, we independently had the idea to go to this international careers networking event um, that in and of itself was not fantastic. It was super <laughs> cheesy. But, awful. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> But, but it was pretty it was pretty cheesy and awful. But um after our kids were born, um the thing that's etched in my memory was a desperate search for something to wear because it was so soon after my daughter was born that I couldn't really fit into any of my work clothes. And then I show up at this networking event and Eve had brought her son with her in a, you know, baby care, baby, you know, sling pouch on her chest. Mm -hmm. So when you're, you know, milling around and looking for some connection to talk to someone about, I said, "Oh my god, I have a kid the same age, and this is one of the first times I've been away from her. And that was it. We <laughs> the network the networking event was pretty cheesy and terrible, and I believe featured a talk by a shaman about you know. Get the, out! <laughs> no, 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 I must have blocked that part it, out. <laughs> that's yeah, hilarious. It, it featured a talk. It featured a talk by a shaman. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, but that's how that's how even I connected. And I mean, we lived, you know, not very far away from each other. And then like mm -hmm. our kids became friends and our husbands became friends. And mm -hmm. so it was um, very serendipitous that we met each other there, even though the event itself was, you know, not the um, shaman. What we hoped yeah, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just realized, guys, we we never talked really about we we talked about the origin of the podcast a little bit, I think, but we didn't um, talk about the our pathway into the profession. Mm -hmm. um, although I, I probably did talk to you individually on the other podcast that shall not be named. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So do you want to give us the, the cliff notes real quick? You two met at an association, as far as I know. Jonathan and I met at the ITI because we were both serving on the board of ITI at the time. Alex, I met you because you've always been busy doing whatever you can <laughs> to, 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 to do the most. So I met you in Berlin at the Feed Congress. Is that right? That is I think correct. that was the first time that we met when yes. you organized the um, booths there. Yeah. Um, so that's how I know the two of you. I don't actually know how you two know each other. Is it from the podcast that shall not be named? Lang <laughs> FM? No. Possibly. Oh, yeah, I think it was. But the, the whole interpreting thing, how did how did that start for you guys? All right. So the whole interpreting thing is just pretty straightforward and actually kind of boring. But um, That's what they all say. It's, it, it's not true. No, <laughs> it's because it's just like, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I wanted to bridge like the cultural divide and I wanted to help people communicate and a lot, a lot. And I just kind of like talking. So it was just kind of a natural, <laughs> kind of a natural fit, and then even like the podcast feels kind of like a natural fit for what I'm, what I want to do. True. And I figured out pretty early that I need to work with English because it's basically all I was really good at in high school, that and French. And initially, I wanted to do American studies, and then we had like this job day at high school, and basically the, the lady there was saying that the only thing that I could do with that is file for unemployment benefits, and I was like, well, that's not. <laughs> was she a shaman by any chance? <laughs> she might have been a shaman. I don't remember. I must have, I must have blocked that out. But um, yeah, so then I basically just looked at what else I can do with English. And I found this weird thing called translation and interpreting. And l funnily enough, that was like on a Wednesday or something. And like that following weekend, they had an open day at the, the language college here in Munich. And I went and you could try, like you could dabble around in interpreting. And I just tried it for like two seconds. And I was like, that is it. Oh my God. Yes, that's exactly what I want to <laughs> do. Neat. Wow, and that's, that's so cool. Yeah. So my story is a bit different. My mum and dad had what they call an open house when I was young, from missionaries to drug addicts, prostitutes, business people, you name it, we had them through from all over the world. All of my friends grew up with like football players, that's soccer for Americans, um, <laughs> posters of them on their Thank wall. Um, whereas I grew up with a massive world map pinned to my wall. So I, I'd always been passionate about the world. And then I went to Germany on a kind of youth mission thing when I was about 14. And I just saw these two people standing at either end of the stage because, you know, they were too cheap to actually use equipment. They were standing at either end of the stage and one of them was turning the German into French and one of them was turning the German into English. And I watched these two people and I, I just decided then and there, that's what I want to do. So I go back to high school and the careers advisor says, well, you need two foreign languages for that. And I thought, I don't really want to learn another foreign language for that. <laughs> I told them at the undergraduate, I want to be a translator or an interpreter. No courses on that at all. Instead, we did Baudelaire and Rambo and Ugh. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. The only thing I learned in my French literature course was that I don't like French literature, or at least not the stuff <laughs> they taught us. Um, he was nodding heavily. <laughs> yeah. I'm so, kind of there with him. Sorry, all my Frenchy friends. Yeah. <laughs> Is it uh, l'étranger? Basically, if no one died or got drugged up, we didn't read it. <laughs> I was looking at, you know, how do I do this interpreting thing and found a brochure for Harriet Watt. And I think I applied almost as soon as I was allowed to because of my degree. And I got accepted there, found out that Harriet Watt allow you to train as an interpreter with just one foreign language. <laughs> so I did translation and conference interpreting there. While I was on my year out, I got to interpret for an entire conference doing all of the French to English. And although it was exhausting, because I had no idea what I was doing, I decided then and there, this is going to be my job. I uh, came back, did the training at Harriet Watt. Didn't enjoy the training so much because in those days it was quite politics, EU, UN, mm. NATO heavy. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I, I much prefer. Imagine what, doing that all day. I, I, can't, I, can't I, I had no idea how people do that. <laughs> it, it would drive people to be really boring. <laughs> but it, once I got out into the world and started doing like commercial stuff and industrial stuff, you know, I. I I would quite happily take the money to do a European Works Council or something institutional, but I'd much rather be doing, you know, trucks driving around the mud track or a thirty million dollar deal. That's far more the kind of thing that I enjoy. The famous dumper truck. Ah, oh, dumper trucks are amazing. But yeah, that, that's just how I fell in love with it. And then while I was interpreting, I had a mini mental crisis to fell in love with research and ended up doing a PhD. I actually now wish that I could go back to myself starting and give myself advice. Mm, I think we all would like to do that from time to time. <laughs> I was just reminded by what you said, Alex, about the how you how we like to talk and talk professionally as well. I just talked today, I, I talked to a um, conference interpreting student here on a study visit to see what interpreting at the U is like. Um, and she was just uh, sitting there and she said, isn't it awful how sometimes interpreters just talk and talk and talk even during the breaks? <laughs> and she was just trying to, you know, get some peace and quiet during the break and not having to listen. So that was that was kind of fantastic. And that kind of reminds me of, of the whole thing that how we have, st how translators and interpreters have these kind of ideas or stereotypes about each other and I thought we could maybe discuss that a little bit. Well, before we do that, I know yeah. we kind of hogged it from you guys. I'd like to hear yeah. Corinne's intro and yours, Alexander, before we move on just quick. <laughs> you guys want to tell us how you entered entered also into the industry? That's right. Um, yeah, I'm going to preface this as well as it's not very interesting, but maybe it is anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I felt actually quite similar to you, Eve, in that I was, I was very interested in foreign languages. Foreign languages was basically the only thing I was good enough in to turn it into a profession. So I I looked around at what the local university had to offer and I knew I didn't want to become a language teacher. And so they had this other thing called translation and interpreting. Um, and back in the day, it was still, it was... Um, it was it was kind of a Y shaped curriculum is what they called it. So you would kind of do both in the first two years, and then you would specialize in translation or in interpreting. And and that sounded interesting. And you had to take an entrance exam, which I did, and I passed. And I thought, well, I might just give it a try. And um, I kind of then found out, just like Jonathan, that this was the thing that I wanted to do. So I I kind of stumbled into the profession, as I like to say, just happy coincidence mostly. Yeah, and for me, um, I guess I did a, a bachelor's and bachelor's degree in English and French. And at the time, I thought um, I really wanted to be a journalist. But I thought, well, I'll do. I went to um, undergrad uh, in a really small town in Western New York, and I thought, you know, if I um, double major in French, I could do study abroad in France for a whole year and get credit for it. So I did that. And then um, after I graduated from undergrad, realized that, you know, French was basically my only marketable skill. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then I did a um, master's degree in French literature. And I actually taught high school French for eight years because I think, um, you know, in the U.S., uh, especially so that I graduated from undergrad in 1993. And when I did study abroad in France, so that would have been in 1992, we were recording required to take a translation class and I loved it. And then I went back to the U.S. and said to one of my French professors,
professors. Um, you know, I, I'm set. I really want to be a translator. And my professor said, well, I don't think that would work out for you because um, you have to have more than language. So you would have to start all over learning another language. And so, you know, my 20-year-old self, I thought, what do I know? She must be right. I may as well mm-hmm. give up on that. And um, and so I just think it's interesting how, especially in the U.S., where translation and interpreting are still, you know, a bit mystical to mm-hmm. the average person or clearly even to a French professor. <laughs> <Obviously>. <laughs> You know, that those little misconceptions, I mean, I think she was well-meaning, she was trying to help, but she just didn't know that those little misconceptions can really, you know, throw people off track. And so then um, I eventually got a master's in French literature, and it really was not until my daughter was born in 2002 that I thought, you know, I would like to find a job where I could work from home and use French while my daughter was little. And that's how I, you know, as I guess all of us did in some way, um, you know, stumbled upon uh, the language professions was just, you know, by virtue of wanting to find a job where I could work from home and use French. Yeah, that was it. What you just said, Corinne, is that that um, the the professions of translation and interpreting are still somewhat mystical, or people don't really know all that much, or maybe they have wrong ideas. Maybe that's also linked to the to the whole thing of stereotypes that I wanted to get to. So it's not just the case that people who have nothing to do with uh, translation or interpreting have certain wrong ideas or stereotypes of what it is all about and what the people are like who do it. But even sort of within the industry, you know, tr- interpreters think certain things about translators, I think, and vice versa. So I just kind of wanted to to address that a little bit. I mean, Jonathan likes to make the joke about the translator wearing a pyjama all day and not leaving the house and being obsessed with details, <laughs> which I don't know. Is, is, no, is, no, no, is no, no, no. Tr- true for me to some extent as well, but maybe we can address that a little bit. I do wear my house bit. sweater. I call this my house sweater. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The listeners can't see us, but you guys can see us right now, and you can attest that we are not in pajamas, and I'm not even in my house. That is true. Yeah, <laughs> and I will readily admit um, admit I was in a, in a sh- um, my my daughter actually got a, a onesie a couple of weeks ago, and she loves it. Oh, yeah. And I was in a in a in a shop the other day, and and they had onesies on offer for grown ups, and mm-hmm. I was really tempted for a few. Moments, I can tell you. I didn't. I, I didn't buy it. Right now, I don't know why, but yeah. <laughs> but it's it's like the old joke, you know. How do you know that you've met an extroverted translator? They stayed at your shoes during the conversation. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, and I oh think. I mean, like, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like all joking aside, I mean, one thing I often say when people bring up that sort of stereotype is like. Does it surprise you that people who are attracted to a job where you work alone at a computer Mm. have a certain type of personality? (laughs) I mean, (laughs) that, you know, that I think, in a sense, stereotypes, A, are always extreme, and B, stereotypes exist for a reason because there's always a shred of truth to them. And I just think, even though Eve and I are probably, you know, more extroverted than the average translator, you know, it still says something that both of us are very happy um, doing a job where you work alone at a computer and it takes someone with a certain, you know, mental state. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, well, about it too. <laughs> what I think it, yeah. attracted Sorry, me. that came out a little differently than I meant. But you know what I mean. <laughs> what yeah. I think has attracted people and has attracted me, even though maybe some of that has too, is that it's super detail oriented. And I know that mm. maybe when we were talking earlier with Jonathan, he was saying, I, one of you guys said that that was kind of bothersome to you but I love that like the detail part of it it's like super detailed and that's kind of you know part of my personality as where you know maybe I I'm okay working in front of the computer but maybe what drew me to it was something a little bit uh, you know one another piece of it right well and I think the um you know that probably translators and interpreters have in common that you realize you know is not common to the general population is the like really granular word nerdery aspect of it Mm -hmm. like even i always say it's a good thing we have each other because our husband's eyes glaze over after about 30 seconds (laughs) of being like oh my gosh this is the most interesting example of that obscure grammar point that i was talking about the other day that she and i will go on for an hour like you know the other day someone another french to english translator we work with taught me the term which i had never heard before retronym Um, Mm -hmm. which means a new word that is coined because of something new that comes on the scene. So for her example was bar soap was just soap until the invention of liquid soap. Right. So, you know, then we needed a new word 
rotary like phone cloth, <laughs> cl- right rotary phone cloth yeah. diaper acoustic guitar world yeah. war one you know all uh-huh. of those terms had to be my personal favorite open sewer yeah <laughs> <laughs> so before before there were closed pipes yeah you know it went without saying that the sewer was open and i just think any of us who are in the tribe, you think like, oh my gosh, I could talk for two hours of now about, I didn't know what a retronym was 30 seconds ago. And now I even have a favorite retronym. Well, I think uh, about too, my husband who is French, but when my kids have French grammar questions, he's like, I don't know, ask your mother, ask your mother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. One of the things and I'm like have. French grammar nerd, so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I've met some interpreters who are really into that. I, I can take or leave that. So we had Susie Dent at the ITI conference mm-hmm a year ago and you can you could see all these translators kind of getting so excited and, and leaning forwards and my kind of nerdiness is different i've as an interpreter i've become really nerdy about watching people yes so my, my oh, running joke is that like i can tell more observing from watching like the, mannerisms and speech patterns and things but, like well that. also yeah. because especially in commercial interpreting if you're not watching that stuff it can go sour very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, I did some participant observation as part of my PhD. And the problem with that is that when you learn how to do it, you then cannot turn it back. off. <laughs> um, so like, mm. I was having this discussion on Facebook recently about I cannot stand crosswords. I hate them. <laughs> and yet most of my translator colleagues are like, you know, devour them. And it's like, yeah. Oh, right. mm-hmm. oh, just give me people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a question for you guys. I was wondering, can you tell us something about interpreting that most of us outside the profession aren't aware of or, or things that you wish the people knew? Something that's kind of a hidden secret, an open hidden secret? Oh. And then all of us speak like 20 languages. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's always the oh, first right. question. I'm sure you guys get the same thing. So I'm sure that's like another thing that actually translators and interpreters both have in common. It's like, oh, how many languages? Interpret. oh how many languages do you speak? It's just yeah. like, yeah. Oh, like two? Oh, well, that's it. And it's like, well, yeah, but isn't that enough? (laughs) But I think Mm -hmm. another answer to that question would also be, um, it depends on what you mean by speak. Oh, I I mean, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Talk about being, you know, detail obsessed and and stuff like that. And because I I find that question very difficult, actually, because we we sometimes speak, I mean, we have our working languages, but then maybe sometimes we have other languages that we just like or that we get into to some degree. And then we, we wouldn't go as far as saying that we speak them, but, you know, we dabble in them, maybe. That's true. I think that's a good the good question. That was something that we want people to know. It's probably that we're not dictionaries on legs, which was the very first episode we did. Yeah, I'm actually starting, by the time this comes out, I have like four videos out. I'm starting a whole new YouTube channel, doing five-minute videos on the basics of interpreting. Mm-hmm. Some of the videos are going to be aimed at interpreters where, you know, here are the things that you probably didn't learn in university that are really helpful to know. And some of them are going to be aimed at people who know nothing about interpreting. And the first video is going to be called Why We Can't Just See What the Person Said. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I would love more people to go, oh, hold on a minute, like French and English. It's not that there's a French word for this English word. Actually, most of the time they divide concepts up completely differently Mm -hmm. so like sheep and mutton in english you only have one word you know it's and it's getting people to understand that no two languages are exactly the same in how they name things so you can never be exactly literal because it doesn't work um and that's the one myth that i wish we could break and it's also the one myth that I wish interpreters would stop saying, please stop saying, we just say what the person said, because you don't, because you can't, because that's basic linguistics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's another thing as well, which I just saw on Twitter today, because there's this new Netflix show with Marie Kondo. Oh, right. The decluttering show. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. And I really want to see it because I'm obsessed with this kind of stuff. But that's beside the point. Anyway, um, <laughs> I think she she works in Japanese, I believe. Um, yeah. And she has an interpreter on the show. I haven't seen it yet. But apparently, she's the interpreter is very visible. Yeah, people were talking about that on Twitter, that it sounds fascinating from the language point of view, because her interpreter is a character in the show. Yeah, oh. which is extremely fascinating. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you know, all the mainstream media who cover it say, well, there's a, the translator. And then, of course, all the interpreters get upset. No, it's actually, a, it's she's mm-hmm. not a translator. She's an interpreter and that kind of thing. So I think that that would be something that many interpreters would like people to understand that it's um, that there are two different professions. I mean, there's lots of overlap, mm. obviously, but they're sort of kind of two different things. People say, you know, are they really that different? I say, well, they're kind of as different as dentistry and urology. 
you really don't want a urologist doing dentistry. <laughs> Neither do you want a dentist doing <laughs> urology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a, a, another um, topic or question, if you will, that, that one of you brought up, I think you, Corinne, um, about the whole question around active languages, passive languages, or n native and non-native languages, mm -hmm. um, which which is very controversial in, in both fields. Um, and um, I know yeah. at least from some professional associations for interpreting that this is always something that gets people riled up and, and where people have very strong opinions of what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed yeah. to do, i.e. working from your C into your B language, for example, is very controversial. Right. But it, it seems to be mm -hmm. similar in, in translation. Well, I'd say, I mean, the thing is that I feel like for translators, it's pretty clear cut that the only, um, I mean, for example, I don't know that any translator would argue that there's an advantage of working into your non-native language unless it's your dominant professional language, which for some people is true. You know, when I talk to some translators who say, you know, I grew up in uh, Saudi Arabia, but I came to the U.S. when I was 16 as an exchange student and I never went back. Um, and so I did, you know, all of my education after age 16 was in English. And now I consider English my dominant professional mm -hmm. language. And actually, if I were to, um, like, if you guys know Joost Zecha, you know, who's German, mm -hmm. who's a translation mm -hmm. technology guru, that he said that when he um, is going to present in German, he has to think it through a lot more. Like, he cannot mm -hmm. present off the cuff in German, um, even though it's his, you know, quote unquote, native language. Yeah, okay. to me, it's sort of more subtle with interpreting, you know, now that I'm at like at the very, you know, beginner end of studying interpreting, is that the hard thing is, at least when you're going, let's say, into your non-native language, you know that you understood the source. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, <laughs> that, you know, so if like, if I can point out an example from your podcast, actually, it was maybe two episodes ago, because I think I'm an episode behind, you guys were talking about the expression A for effort. And one of you said, where does that joke even come from? Because mm -hmm. the word effort starts with E. Yeah. And the thing is, <laughs> I, I think that. it's like Jonathan, right. I think it might not, not even be obvious to Jonathan Downey, who's obviously a native English speaker, because in the U.S. educational system, when you're little, you get two grades, one for effort and one for achievement. And oh. we get letter grades, A, B, C, D. <sighs> and so A for effort is a yes. sort of tongue-in-cheek way of saying the person who tries really hard and doesn't quite get it. <laughs> you know, like the person who got an A for effort because they got a C minus. Because an A is a good grade, is I the had best no man. Yeah, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So there's an example that, like, you know, for you guys, you understood the words perfectly well. But for me, if I had been interpreting into French, I think I would struggle to interpret that concept into French, yeah. but the expression A for effort would be very clear to me. And that's the thing that I think, you know, it's more subtle for interpreters. So I don't know. I'd just like to hear you guys riff on that a little bit. So I guess um, as an interpreter who's done most of his work into his B language, which is the opposite mm -hmm. to the way things are, um, yeah. I find that actually one of the great myths about interpreting is that you need to know all the words. <laughs> so yeah. even if I didn't understand, like, I mean, you the, heard the, it all, here, all ladies the and words. gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, even if I didn't understand the US education system, which I didn't, I'm not sure anyone yeah. understands any educational system, mm. um, least of all those in it. But they. And by the way, sorry for taking an example from your podcast. That that's was, fair. You know, that's totally fine. But, it, um, but just but, when I heard it, I. It, it, it brought that concept home to me. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so if I if I had someone, so for instance, not everything in a formal meeting is said formally. Mm -hmm. um, oh no! <laughs> so if I had, you know, if something had happened and the American delegate said, "Well, I'll give you an A for effort," their tone and the context tells me exactly uh, what I need mm -hmm. yeah. to be able to right. find the French. So it's I'd this probably, tongue in cheek thing yeah. for nice try, but not quite there. Yeah, so yeah. I would probably say, you know, good try, or at least you tried, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think mm. the the difficult the difference I find with translation is if if we don't get a word at least eight times out of ten, the context tells us everything we need to know. Hmm. Mm. Whereas mm -hmm. in translation, if you don't, and I remember when I was translating, this is what bugged me: is if you don't get a word in translation, you might know what it means, 
but there's often, especially in things like scientific translation or legal translation, there is the word that you have to use. And if you don't know that word, you mm. have to spend ages going and referencing for it. Whereas, yeah, we will have, and I do expect my brood mates to be doing terminology searches while I'm working. It's mm. part of being mm. a team. But in some ways, I, a lot of times you don't need it. It's just helpful if it comes up again so that you're not having to find another solution. Well, I think, and too, in translation, that comes up to where we talk a lot about specialization, specialization, where, you know, Mm. like that might happen to me sometimes, but if that's happening to me all the time, then I need to specialize in something else. And obviously, I don't know that specialty. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Fair point. Mm. Yeah, I think I think another aspect, and I don't know if you you agree there, Jonathan and and Alex, is that um, sometimes I feel it also depends on the topic. So Mm -hmm. some topics I'd rather work into English, some I'd rather work safe from French, if that makes any sense. Mm. So mm-hmm. I think there's something to to that um, as well. So I, I don't know if that's related necessarily to the terminology of the field or if it's just personal preference. Um, but I think that that, that plays a, a role as well. And, and since uh, one of you said that um, supposedly when you work from your native language or your A language or whatever, um, you have at least you have understood everything, I think sometimes that can also be a problem because Mm. the fact that you have understood everything um, can sometimes sort of block you, you know, because you you feel like you have to bring everything across um, when you can't or when maybe you shouldn't even. So I Mm -hmm. think that's that's another thing to Mm. to bear in mind. I'm sure this doesn't happen in the commission, but uh, Alex Gansmeyer, are you... Are you with me that, so I have a preference, if people are being sneaky, I would rather they were sneaky in English. If people are, be, so, so long as they're Not sneaky in, in my, yeah, no, well, because if they're sneaky mm. in French, I don't always notice that they're being sneaky. Oh yeah, that's tricky. If oh, they're sneaky gotcha. in English, yeah, I get yeah. it. Mm. So you can read it better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if, right. if there's any hun- underhandedness going on, you can do it in English all you like and I'll be fine, but it's French understatement. Sometimes you just, miss <laughs> so there was a really famous one where i got fooled by an agency i ended up doing a day and a half of shushotage yeah so the first half day was an evening agm and the french delegates were saying one thing out loud to the chair in french and another thing to each other and then blaming mm. me that the english delegate the british delegation and the chair were taking them at the word die interpreted hmm if someone does that in English, I can figure that there are ways that I can deal with that. If you do that in French, I find them less able to... Maybe to reading the culture, some of the cultural cues or something you're saying. Yeah. In, in, yeah. Interpreting in quotes the cultural cues. Yeah, and also uh-huh. in, in interpreting... I don't think German has it, but, but French has ways of saying things that could either mean they're being completely honest and upright Mm-hmm. Right, or they're taking you for a ride and you really have to listen right. very closely and almost know the person mm. whereas right. a sneaky Brit for a, a fellow Brit we're so used to sneaky Brits we can <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I heard someone give the example that I thought was interesting of in pretty much any language you can point to if you take the expression more or less like I'm more or less finished with that mm. it definitively means more or less <laughs> <laughs> like in yeah. some languages. <laughs> in Germany, it means I'm basically done. Yeah. 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 But in, <laughs> right. But in, in, you can sort of divide languages into two camps. Does that mean, you know, I'm, I'm basically done? Or does that mean I haven't started it yet, but I'm not admitting that? Uh-huh. And so I think that's like what Jonathan is getting yeah. at is yeah. that yeah. your quote unquote non native language mm. that you sort of miss that. Like, no, no, what they're saying is they don't agree at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and but, I'm sure that comes up less in translation, but mm-hmm. that does come up sometimes when I've edited people's yeah, stuff. Does. Just just because yep. French is my non-native language too, but I've been, you know, going there 30 years, married to French guy, lived there, blah 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 blah. Mm. And so then I, I look at stuff sometimes editing, and I'm thinking, just like I can't give an example, but you guys have given enough, you know. And I'm, I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, no, 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 they missed it. They meant the opposite of that in French, <laughs> right. or because yeah. it's you know anyway that kind of thing. Well, that will happen a lot when Germans speak English, um, and in yeah. a way where they basically uh-huh. use German syntax and just fill in some English words and then they often say the complete opposite of what they intend to say and then with your German background background you can sort of infer what what they were actually getting at 
Which is always going to be super easy, obviously, for the German English booth, but every other booth is just going through hell with yeah, that stuff. They have no idea what's going I, on. I yeah. actually wanted to bring up like, another point, which I think is really interesting, and it's, it's sort of a difference between translation and interpreting, at least when it comes to the finished product, because when something outrageous happens or something says something completely outlandish and you can see like the the delegates responding very weirdly like sometimes it's possible for you as the interpreter to kind of take a step back and say so this is him saying that so you can kind of like point out that it's not actually you as the interpreter yeah. just going on with complete nonsense it's actually what they're saying and you oh, can make that very yeah. clear in an instance where there might be otherwise confusion and they're you know they might be thinking oh the interpreters really sucks like they have no idea what they're talking about and it's like no that's <laughs> have you ever done that though i have yeah. i mean really distance yourself content wise from this not because of the content and i've not distanced myself i just made it clear that this is actually what they're saying like i'm not okay, just making like, this no, no, this is what up. he's actually this, saying yeah this right. is actually what's going on at the moment well i think actually and, when we we may have a more clear way to do that in French because sometimes in French, I mean, sorry, in, in French, in translation, <laughs> sometimes we have that too, where I think, you know, I'll be thinking through, that's another, like, um, I think hazard of the profession because I think, through, oh, they could do this, they could think this, they could think that, they could think that, being the detail person trying to think of all the different right. scenarios, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. so when I, so I don't try not to do it a lot, but when I worry about that, I put sick, you know, in, in English, um, right. open brackets, S-I-C, close brackets, because we also do have that concern sometimes where I think they're going to think I got this wrong, but that's exactly what they mm -hmm. wrote. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I do sometimes when I have to um, insert a really horrible profanity into a translation. So, for example, um, I translated a while ago a bunch of discovery documents for a big corporate lawsuit where we translated all the employees' emails because they thought that there was some shady stuff going on in the background, which there was. And they <laughs> described and they described the head honcho of this company in these horrible, vulgar terms. And you can't say wow. jerk. You know, when it that's says yeah, something, that's what they're saying. Yeah. 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 When it says mm -hmm. something like horribly profane. Mm -hmm. And so then I would actually insert a note and say, this is a direct translation of the French profanity. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's something like what you were talking about, you know, Alexander of saying, no, no, this is what the person is really saying. Right. Yeah. The yeah. person is blathering on nonsense because they're, you know, getting super emotional or they're confused or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's super interesting, Corinne, because I had a, a similar thing last year. I wonder if it was the same client. I don't think so. But I was thinking, <laughs> but I was thinking too. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. But I think that that comes into the thing, too, where it's not our role to say jerk because that's not what they're saying. You know, they're saying that's right. of, you know, uh -huh. something a lot worse. Sorry, John. I actually really revel in, in interpreting profanity because it like either <laughs> there, there's like two types of recipients when that happens. Either the person, the people, the person listening wasn't really listening in the first place. And then as soon as you say some really bad word, like it's kind of like a whiplash yeah. and it's like they've suddenly <laughs> woken up. What? Yeah, it's like yeah. exactly what is going on. That's number one. And number two is they <laughs> are basically like a marble statue. Like they don't move at all. And then you know, okay, now they're really going in for the kill. Like now they've had it. <laughs> and those are like the two types in the meetings. And it's always kind of curious because you always have like a hunt as to who is going to be who, but sometimes there's surprises. So I find that very interesting. Mm -hmm. So I, I had one where it wasn't a profanity, but I realized that they were, it was a debate over the meaning of quality and quality. Oh, and yeah, favorite. it turned out that they were, uh, th this is in my new books. So I really shouldn't say it, but anyway, um, it turned out they were defining it in opposite ways and the meeting almost crashed because they were defining quality in, in exactly opposite terms and getting really confused at each other. Mm -hmm. And in that occasion, I think I said something like, um, excuse me, the interpreter believes there's been a misunderstanding and then said it in French and, and explained. That's less available to you in simultaneous. But I have done maybe once or twice in my career and I've heard of other interpreters doing it maybe once or twice, something like um, l'orateur dit when you really think that there's a danger to your reputation or safety. Mm. Um, it's incredibly rare, but there are times when someone's getting really, really super, super angry and everyone starts looking at the booze. Mm. Sometimes you have to explain that uh, the, uh, the speaker is beginning to get rather angry at the moment. Well, it's kind of like you're reminding them as a non-interpreter, that sounds to me like you're reminding them of the actual process. Like you're saying, don't get sucked so much into just like, you know. Yeah. You know, you don't want to look at me. You're reminding them this is a process, and I'm, you know, just representing what they're saying. Now, it, it should be vanishingly rare, um, mm -hmm. and it is in my career vanishingly rare. Yeah, hopefully. But I think we're kidding ourselves if we don't think that translators and interpreters have both professional reputations and, on occasion, professional safety to look after. 
there are issues where I know of interpreters, if you're interpreting for dangerous people, you have to make it clear to all and sundry that the words coming out your mouth are not, oh, not your own. You yeah. know, it's not mm-hmm. the interpreter threatening someone. With, yeah. Um, and if you're a good interpreter, sometimes people forget that. And that's what I was great, saying. Like they'll be sucked but, into it. You were sucked into it, and then you and have to say, idea. "No, no, no. I mean, this yeah. is the process. I'm not the sayer. I'm not the emitter of this." Yeah, I think it speaks to someone else that I think you brought up as a as a question, Jonathan. Um, the, the the whole question of of context and mm. history, uh, if you will. And I, I think the question was that um, on the one hand, in interpreting, you do have a lot of context. So you see people, you see how they react, you see the body language, you see how other people react to what the person is saying, to what the speaker is saying. And in translation, you don't necessarily have that. Um, at least that's that's probably the idea that we as interpreters have, at least, is that you have your text and you have to translate it. And maybe you get to ask a few questions to your client, but the client may not necessarily be the one who wrote the text or, you know. So how do you deal with that kind of... It, does it does it sometimes feel like working in a, in a void? Because that's what's so so specific about interpreting, we always work in a context. And that's, I think, why so many interpreters are reluctant to work remotely, um, because that they see the risk that they lose that context and that, that they get out of the situation. Well, I guess one thing we have to help us with that is time. I mean, that we have time to research, you know, to research it in certain ways. Mm. And I think, probably, you know, I started in this industry when the internet was just a baby, but we were starting to use it. <laughs> and I think that that probably was even a bigger issue for people who were doing this before the internet, because a lot of times you can find, oh, I realize this is from this website and this this is what they're talking about, or mm. not always, but I mean, there's, there's many, many resources resources available to us with and with just that maybe coming like you said from the outside you're thinking oh there's not a lot of context but for us we see all the words around it as the con you know we think oh that's a lot of it is significant and helps us or whatever Mm -hmm. plus the research so i what do you think about that corinne um i think i i agree with that but i also think um it in certain client situations, it is really difficult. I mean, one time um, I remember hearing Karen Kachik, who's another uh, Scottish French to English translator that Eve and I are friends with here in Colorado, give the example, which I think has happened to all of us, of if you're translating through an agency and you ask Mm -hmm. a pretty basic question Mm -hmm. about context, for example, um, you sent me this press release and I'm wondering, um, is the client having this translated because they would like to know what it says in English or do they intend to use it as a marketing piece Mm -hmm. in English? Mm -hmm. And that the agency will say, um, we don't know and it's not possible to ask the client, so (laughs) you should just use your best judgment. I think, um, you know, that's a not atypical situation um, for a translator. I mean, I think, you know, um, when you work, and again, these are generalizations, but typically, you know, when you work mostly with direct clients, for example, I do a lot of um, international development translation of documents from West Africa that have concepts I'm not really familiar with. And it's possible to ask the client, you know, can you send me a picture of a health hut? so that I can get an idea of what this thing is. Does that mean small hospital? Is it literally a hut? Um, You know, what is it made of? The the vacuum situation does certainly happen and it's not at all uncommon that, um, and by that I don't mean anything negative about agency Mm -hmm. clients. I'm just talking about the business model, that it's possible that they would say, we don't know and we have no way to find out you know, make your best call. I think another example that is software localization is that, um, because I, you know, been doing a lot of software localization all over the decades. And I always tell my clients when I, because I also run languages for other, other, you know, sometimes I'll run other languages, project manage other languages. And so like you're saying, Karina, it made me think of that right away is that I work it into the process because I, I say, you know, I'm sorry, but you can't say you don't want us to do linguistic testing because I'm not going to do it then <laughs> because that's part of the process. <laughs> it doesn't mean like, oh, we, we want to pay for that. Well, okay. <laughs> I mean, that idea mm-hmm. where we have to see it in the context, especially with that, because it's just these kind of strings that are by themselves. So that like mm-hmm. you're saying um that's part of the process that you need to work that in if it's possible to do that so you can see in more context i mean for for us one of the things i said on was it the last episode or the one before about we'd always we always come in in the middle of a conversation <laughs> um mm-hmm. now the great thing about interpreting is so for instance uh, i've done a few deep sea fisheries policy meetings and the first one of those you do for the first hour you're just staring and going how am I ever going to get through this? Because obviously these people have known each other for 
ever. And they know what a Zeno Fire 4 is and they know what this is and they know and you're just even if you've done the research, you just look at it and go, I see lots of lines on a screen and I'm not sure what they mean. <laughs> but but after the first kind of hour, hour and a half, you're fine. Um, and so we have the advantage that although we come in in the middle of a conversation, we can pick it up relatively quickly. Uh, what I always find hard in translation is that sometimes you're coming in in the middle of a conversation and even by the end of the translation, you weren't clear what the conversation <laughs> was about. That's so know, true. Yeah, did did, that's did so anyone true. else have texts like that where you go, I, I know you've sent me this for a reason and you've even sometimes you get the brief and you go, okay, can I get a terminology list for the brief? <laughs> Right, but I mean that's that's the thing, right? Uh, I, I think I do very very little translation these days, but um, I, I did more of that um, when I was still freelancing. But I always found both activities very very mutual, mutually beneficial. The, the ideal mix, I think, if if you can do both, and maybe ideally even for the same client, um, would be that you kind of mix the the obsession over details and the kind of the long research and uh and going really into the depth with um maybe being more uh focused on on the communication part if if you get my drift so if you can kind of marry both of that because i some i mean the reason why i'm thinking of this is my wife she also studied to become an interpreter but mostly works in translation nowadays and i sometimes proofread her stuff um and sometimes um i think well this this is technically correct but i think you're too close to the original so it doesn't really make sense well, like, or it no doesn't one really would say that yeah you don't right. want to say it like that people understand what it means but nobody would say it like that exactly yeah. and then sometimes i change something and and, and she'll say well it sounds nice but that's actually not what the original says and so i i always find <laughs> that having that's an extreme example but i think you know what i mean so having having both together i think is kind of ideal even though there are two mm -hmm. separate professions i think it's nice if you can do both from time to time maybe focusing a bit more on the interpreting part or the translation part but um yeah, that that wasn't really a question. I just realized. Yeah. I actually had the same conversation with a colleague like a few years ago because in the beginning, obviously, I think even if you want to become an interpreter full time, I think everybody in the beginning, especially, does translations because they are somehow easier to get by than proper paying interpreting jobs, in the, especially in the beginning. Um, so I did a lot more translation in the beginning, and I, for me, it was always just kind of like a means to an end. You know, it was just kind of kind of like I need to pay rent. I need to buy food that kind of thing um and i stopped translating pretty much completely as soon as you know i could basically live off interpreting and for me it was kind of a relief because i used to do this i still do the same thing so if a client of mine actually asked me to do a translation for them i will not say no i will obviously do it especially if it pertains to a particular conference i'm doing or i don't mm. know meeting or whatever exactly. because then it's yeah. basically paid preparation so that makes makes sense to me um but I really dislike doing it because it's kind of like the sort of Damocles always like hovering above my head, you know, while I'm out and about, <laughs> like tr interpreting. Like I always have to do translations, maybe like five minutes here, five minutes there, but I never really have the time to basically sit down and like do it properly. And then it just kind of stresses me out on top of the stress that you already have when you prepare for an interpreting mm -hmm. assignment, mm -hmm. do your admin, do your invoicing, do the actual interpreting. So mm -hmm. for me, even though I totally see what you are saying in that it kind of keeps you grounded and more detail focused for me it just was an enormous stress factor when i was still doing both like especially you because like you're getting into interpreting right I, I don't know do you see it how do you see it let me actually ask you because i don't well, know no no i mean the thing i was going to say is um you know i do uh more than actually interpreting which i don't do professionally at all right now i just like to talk to a lot of interpreters <laughs> right <laughs> and one one thing that um, several of the full-time professional interpreters I've talked to have said is when you do an interpreting job, for better or worse, it's over. Yeah. <laughs> You know, when, when it, yeah. whether it went well or whether it went horribly, I mean, I guess you could argue, um, I would assume you guys are recorded a fair bit of the time and how much mm. does that affect the, you know, it's over phenomenon. Um, but that what they've said is the thing that they find very cognitively different about translation is that you keep stewing over it in your mind, mm. you yeah. know, or sometimes even call the client and say, you know, stop the presses. We, <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of a better term. 
<laughs> yeah. Or worse, or worse, re- if you really want to never sleep again, read your old translations uh, from ten years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> and and find things in them. You know, not only things you wish you could have said better, but errors for that matter. Mm. Whereas a couple of interpreters I've talked to have said, you know, what I like about it is especially, you know, when you're doing simultaneous interpreting, you're just, you know, going, 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 and then when it's done, it's, it's over, done. and for better yeah. or worse, you know, there's, you know, the point final. That's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I fully agree. But the, the going back to old stuff is is really uh, dangerous because I translated a book uh, when I was still in university, I think, and it's still it's still up on Amazon. And just just for fun, I went back the other day to the entry, and there was a review, and it said that the, I think it said that the translation was clumsy or something like that. And I said, oh, <laughs> But oh, no. it was it was it was probably right, you know. But um, I just I just shouldn't have gone back and checked. <laughs> I now have a folder in my email in my work email called "Old Projects, Please Ignore." <laughs> Perfect, <laughs> right. because you would go searching for something, yeah, and you would find old things where you were searching for something else, and especially. Yes. Right. I, I've had a couple. Let me of just take a look. Yeah, let me just take <laughs> Actually, a look. Actually, I approached that. I learned this years ago from Lillian Clementi, who's another uh, French English translator, and I learned the opposite of, from her. And her thing was, and I've always called it what she called it. She said she has a folder called I Love Me, and I do that too. And when people send me things like That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Like this, I love this translation, or you did a really great job for us. And I, and I do mm. go back and look at those sometimes. I'll be like, oh, who loves me? You know. Yeah. <laughs> I, so I put that in my journal, really but cool. it's the same idea. Yeah, that, that really yeah, helps. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I need to get one of them because I've noticed uh, one of the things that really helps is at the moment, the biggest project I'm working on is a second book. And I made the classic author mistake. Anyone who's written a book will tell you never, ever leave your most difficult chapters until, until last. Because then the end of the writing process is, how am I going to finish this thing? And I left my two most difficult chapters until last. And, you know, I, I was all day in the National Library today going, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reread all of the other chapters. <laughs> Just in case. Um, but what helps with that is the the really nice reviews. And even one review that found something that the guy didn't like. Hmm. Uh, Andrew Gillies found a couple of things that he didn't agree with and he didn't like, but it was a really great review. And when, when Andrew Gillies, who is... A renowned interpreter says, this is a book that everyone should buy. I put that as a big tick. Mm. And then a big I love me. You should have yeah, that framed right. on the wall somewhere. <laughs> I, I am gonna get I am gonna get that framed somewhere and I'm gonna completely ignore the other comment that someone <laughs> did responding to that review on a, a translators and interpreters forum saying, yeah. it's okay, everyone can have my copy. I was just gonna throw it out anyway. I'm like, Whoa, oh, really wow. people can I just ask a question to Corinne and Eve? Because I was wondering, Corinne, you were saying that you kind of stew over the translation a bit. And that was always something that I just loathed because for me, it just took forever. And I remember like this one time I had this 20 page translation, which is basically nothing in the big picture, right? Like it's just nothing. And to me, it just felt eternal. Like it was just a never ending project in my mind. And I think why it was such a relief for me to stop translating is because I, my ADHD was kind of too intense for, for it. You know, to kind of like focus on one thing for this amount of time, which is the good thing about interpreting, right? Cause you get different speakers, different conferences every single day. So how do you guys keep the focus on one project? Because 20 pages it's, is not much, right? So let's say you're doing a book on a topic, which might not necessarily be the most riveting topic in the world. Like how do you guys hmm. stay sharp on that and not just kind of like zone out? Oh, I kind of like doing it because it's kind of the opposite of where you're coming from. Because I feel like I'm I'm learning about like I like the bigger projects, and then I feel like oh yeah, all the energy I'm into learning the you know learning with the author's approach, learning the new terms or whatever. Then I can use that for much longer than if it's a two page document. Oh. Mm-hmm. So it's really you know then I'm I, I, it's funny. I'm interested to hear what you said too because you don't really you don't think about how other people think you know about it. <laughs> for me, I do that, that all the I, time actually. Yeah, <laughs> is that um is that I feel kind of sad sometimes like, Oh, it's over. You know, and I, you know, I learned all this <laughs> stuff and I got to move on. <laughs> but then I also, wish I'd known you back then. <laughs> <laughs> but also kind of um, what Corinne said in some ways I do feel though too, like, okay, it goes on longer, right? Some of the bigger projects go on longer, but then when they're done, I, you know, I don't personally ruin it on them after they've been turned in. And, and, it, mm, and sometimes right. I do feel like, okay, well, you know, I can't be stressed out about this anymore because it's done. It's turned in. It's over. You know, <laughs> mm. so, I don't know. That's kind of way I see. Kind it. of got to like go to, yeah. How do yeah. you deal with every translation project that I've had that's more than a day long? There's always the 
three or four hours at least of the passage where you, you know I, I had a really exciting project that I really enjoyed but there was still three or four hours during the project where I was so bored I must have had about six cup of six cups of tea every hour how do you deal with the project where you know it might be a nice project but there's this passage that is going to take you a three hours or a day and it's just horribly mm -hmm. boring or do you never get that because you're such amazing translators? I don't your know. Rates. I guess we'd look at it differently in different ways. Raise your rates. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you know, if, if that happens a lot, like I said before, if that's happening to you a lot, then you're doing the wrong kinds of translations. I mean, to my mm. mind, you know, like me, right, if I yeah. if I kept happening, I would turn those down. You know, like maybe right, I know mean, I would think, oh, I'll take legal, and I don't I don't right. take legal because I don't like it. You know, mm. right? Yeah. And um, <laughs> you know, raise your rates is it's a joke, but not a joke. I have a client, and I yeah. won't say anything about the work because I don't want them to know who they are because I'm very grateful for the work who has their work is is would is extremely boring i mean <laughs> the safety pins under safety pins under your fingernails boring yeah. oh. um but for real i mean i my tactic is you know i actively seek out work that i think is really interesting and meaningful and that i love translating mm -hmm. but when a client comes to me with work that is you know none of those things i charge enough that i really think i'll, I'll be bored for that amount <laughs> you know? that's, yeah. oh yes yes that, that's, 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 that's a that's Board yeah, out. like I always say, I, I really do not like doing, Corinne doesn't mind these, but I really cannot stand, I mean, I shouldn't say that, I don't like doing as much as other things, <laughs> um, um, transcripts. And so what I do is I think, what kind of money would it take for me to do it? And then if I quote people that and they say no, I'm like, okay. And if they say yes, then I'm like, great, because I said that I would do it for that much. And that's what I, that's what I'm, you know, that's what I'm willing to take it for. Mm -hmm. you know? I, I, I'm thinking of starting <laughs> to raise my rates for AGMs. Alexander Gansmar. AGMs, what are they like for an interpreter? I think they're an awesome amount of fun. What? I really do. <laughs> because it's like, it's like bad shit, crazy stuff keeps happening. Like, I swear to God, I have to tell you guys a story. It's well, wait, first, first, for us not interpreters, you have to define an AGM. Oh, sorry, an AGM, <laughs> right? So, Jonathan, it's, go ahead. It's an annual general meeting. Mm. And there are two types of, of AGM. Uh, so if you get a big organization, they have to have an annual general meeting every year. If they're international, they're going to have interpreters there. Yeah. And a type one AGM is you spend a day, sometimes two days, just interpreting stuff. And it kind of makes sense, but you, you get to the point where, as I said with some colleagues, an AGM I did once, did anyone actually understand what was going on? You know, you understand the language, but you don't understand mm -hmm. what's going on. And it's just like a day or two days of nah, 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 nah. And, <laughs> uh, and if you weren't bored enough so, by the chair's address, here's the finance director's address. Nah, nah, so nah, listen, nah, nah, nah. Jonathan, it's really funny that you would say that because just the other day or like the other week, I actually had an AGM, um, like a yes. year end AGM. They have a weird timing, but we <laughs> understood exactly what was going on, but we didn't understand the language. So we just kind of like held on for dear life and we just kind of did it because, you know, when you have these shareholders asking all these questions and then the questions are being sent back to the legal department, which is backstage, and then they phrase out a fully formed <laughs> like legal opinion, give it to the CFO, and then he just reads it out. Mm. And this is like pages mm. of legalese answers. And so that, that's basically what you do all day. But there was yeah. this one incredible guy who came on and he has like one share of like every company in Germany. I don't even know. Um, and he just came in and he started rambling about this guy called, I don't know, I'm just going to call him Jochen. I have no idea. Just like some some guy. And then, he kept on, and then he kept going like, yeah, and then Jochen called me and he said, listen, I'm standing by this electricity box and like it's raining and I just saw this cat and he just like went on and on like <laughs> rambling the most bizarre thing ever and i kid you not both of my like it was obviously my turn because every time something crazy like that happens it's my turn but both of my colleagues had to leave the booth because they had to giggle so much it was <laughs> most <laughs> like, laughing so hard they couldn't even be in there exactly oh like it was that the most happens because yeah. you know i had to keep a straight face like i really really tried and obviously if they were both sitting next to me okay. like i i couldn't <laughs> i just couldn't do it and well, it was the, most the, extraordinary the, even this is why i love interpreting because one i didn't realize that you could actually make money doing so many different things i've been in places that human beings don't that you know non-specialists don't normally go into <laughs> human beings and, then, and interpreters oh yeah and then yeah. also like so a type one agm is just quite boring a type two agm something wacky or crazy or exciting or ooh, slightly off happens you're and, and the cat, yeah, you're <laughs> and the cat or, yeah. or you or you get 
random angry guy and it's always random angry guy. Yeah, of course. Or you or you get um you get a ton of pensioners. Oh, the pay, have you oh, ever had tired people with yeah, too yeah, much yeah. time? Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. They come for the buffet, but they stay for the show. I was yeah. gonna say. I, I, th- I thought the only way to translate those and interpret those association AGMs. Mm. But anyway, that's <laughs> a different thing. Let's not get into that. You, you also do get um, so so. There's the the most dangerous thing to say at corporate AGM is if the chair says, "Does anyone have any questions?" <laughs> Because what happens next is you get a couple of, you know, you, first you get silence, then you get this, and it's always a guy who puts his hand up. And if the chair sighs, you change interpreters. <laughs> <laughs> because if the, if the chair sighs, then only one, per, one person has put their hand up, and it's that oh. guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going yeah, to yeah. be a long and day. <laughs> they, they also go to political summits. And yeah. you recognize them because they, they stand up and they, they pick up a sheaf of paper. Oh no! <laughs> That's when you know it's time to make sure you've had your caffeine and your sugar that day. Yeah. So they they read their sheaf of paper, which is all, always written in size six font, single spaced, no <laughs> margins, and they think you know once they've gotten through their sheaf of paper, which by the way has no questions on it at all, no. despite the fact the chair asked, "Does anyone have any questions?" You think they're finished. But oh no, so more or less, <laughs> they're <laughs> not <laughs> finished because then what they do is they bang their paper really loudly next to the microphone to give the, the interpreters a migraine and then they turn it over and start from the back because obviously yeah. they've written double-sided as well. I don't know, there must be like a small factory somewhere that produces them or it's just the same person who goes to every AGM. Honestly, yeah, I was just going to say, we have like five, yeah. I, and it's kind of sad that I, that I can say this, but there are five <laughs> shareholder representatives in Germany that I actually know by name. And when I see them, like a when lot. I, yeah, and it's just, it's kind of ridiculous that I know these names, but when you get them on like the call list on the call sheet for the conference, you're just like, oh crap. <laughs> always there. Like they're always there. Like this is their job to be at these conferences. And you're always thinking maybe they can make it today, but they always do. Something that you said earlier is that you like about the profession, your profession is that it covers a lot of different topics. And yeah. I think that we feel that way too. Like little translator nerd groups will be saying, oh yeah, we heard so-and-so's translating about this topic and that's what we love so much about our profession. So I put some examples of stuff, mm. you know, like I thought, okay, there's the financial reports, there's the legal documents, there's the technical text, you know, blah, blah, blah. But what about genealogy? What about, I've done really cool stuff translating on skiing. <laughs> and Corinne and I have done some cool stuff about meditation and it, it was this book we did and I thought like okay that's weird and then I started using the techniques with my son you know <laughs> I mean like I just like, practice all these different kinds nice. of things you know board games I, I did a chick lit book recently I was hired to translate this um you know chick lit book <laughs> and I think about <laughs> stuff we might not think of that translation touches like um my mother we used to do tatting does anyone know what tatting is no I have no idea Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, lace making. It's lace Belgian making. style lace oh. making. So I was thinking, and she used ah. to get these really bad translations because they, the, you know, years ago before the internet and all that, but she would say, I can't really understand these instructions, you know? <laughs> so I think even for things that we think are, we never heard of, or we think it wouldn't matter, mm. people might think that wouldn't matter, wouldn't oh, yeah. make a difference to it, you know? And right. I have another example is I have, he- I have heated floors in my house. I have a new house and I, I want hey. to. I love <laughs> heated floors. That's oh, fancy. And, um, it's the best. Yeah. But um, but the instructions. I'm I I I've, I've tried to contact the company and, and offer them services because in English they are incomprehensible. Hmm. So I'm just thinking like there's all you know just what you said. <laughs> you like the variety and there's all these different things the translation touches and just different things that we come in contact with that we wouldn't that have known about otherwise. And it's hmm. fun. A, a few yeah. years ago, in the same week, I was up in Inverness in Scotland, which is a lovely place to go. In the same week, I went from hardcore technical manufacturing which was one of the best GM uh, AGMs that I ever did. It was a lovely AGM. Hardcore technical manufacturing, two-day break, mountain tourism. Mm. And the challenge then was swapping gears because like, I've, I've noticed with translation, it's actually quite easy to change gears. If you know, if you finish the translation at midday, you can have lunch and you can go really easily into a different one. It, it, your brain's not completely messed up. But I just had you know two days of super technical AGM style stuff and to to then have two days to get myself ready for mountain tourism in a completely different setting was I actually found that quite challenging and also seeing the difference in how different clients treat you so the industrial client put us in a really nice spa hotel 
the other client put us in a hotel so small that when I hung my suit jacket up in the cupboard, it was uh, it was touching the floor. So I tell people that I closed the cupboard, reopened it, and went, Bilbo, come on an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Lord of the Rings joke. Really yeah, we got that, Jonathan. Adventure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I actually just had like a follow-up question to kind of what Jonathan was just saying, you know, switching from one job to the other because that happens quite a bit. Um, you know, like one day I might be doing like a supervisory board, the next day I'm doing like a press conference or whatever. How but there's rarely any overlap. So like what we call in, in Munich, we call like a double whopper um, <laughs> is when you have like a very short job in the morning or maybe until like lunchtime. And then you have like a like a press conference or like an award ceremony like in the evening. But that happens like twice a year if you're lucky. Um, so there's really no overlaps in the jobs. Like do you guys ever have like overlaps or like scheduling mm-hmm. conflicts in your translations or do you do like one after the other? Do you take on like multiple jobs at, the t- at a time? I think Corinne should answer this because Corinne is like the queen of organization and I'm not. So Corinne, you answer this one. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. If you saw my house, you wouldn't say that. No, Eve sees my house all the time. <laughs> Just wait till um, you watch Marie Kondo on Netflix. Oh, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> I know. I could. I have so many things in my house that do not spark joy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ouch. They're, yeah, they're gone. You know the lingo. Yeah. yeah. Um. I don't know. I'd answer that in a few different ways. Like in a sense, I would sort of turn it back and say like, God, you guys are the ones that I don't know how you do it with the scheduling. Because for us, I think the real repercussion is, or I mean, I can say what I do personally is I try to set my rates and actively market enough that I can have about 20 billable hours a week and earn what I want or need to earn. And so the thing is that then if two clients need me at once for a really big project, which does happen happen sometimes because mm. I work mostly for direct clients. So I really, really mm. try not to turn them down right, unless right. Eve can take it. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> the, the, real, the real repercussion, I mean, my, I feel like for us, it's actually simpler because the real repercussion is you just work more, mm. um, you know, that on those rare weeks where you have two good clients that have a big project that you can't say no to, that you just um, work more. And that for me, you know, I don't want to depend on having to translate, you know, 15,000 words a week, every single week in order mm. to earn my target income. Right. And obviously yeah. my situation is a little bit different because I'm about um, 50% translation and 50%, you know, books and classes and stuff like that. But I mean, for you guys, I think like, okay, you have a good client who says, we need you for this two-day assignment. And then you have another good client who says, we need you for a two-week assignment that overlaps the two-day assignment. Mm, I mean, I think for us, Mm. it's pretty simple because we can, I mean, not pretty simple. It might take some late nights, but we can do it. We can, we can, right. Yeah. But you guys can't be double. There's not two of right. So like, it's not unusual that Eve and I all talk to each other and, um, you know, Eve has more energy than I do. So she'll usually be the one saying, (laughs) you know, I had this project that I couldn't say no to. And I've worked until, you know, past 1130, you know, for four nights in a row or whatever. Mm. But, you know, that's doable. Then you give yourself a few days off and, you know, calm your mind and things like that. But I think my question would be, how do you guys deal with that? Because we can, you know, sort of be in two places at once, whereas you guys can't physically be. And I bet that like two day, two week thing happens, right? It does. Yeah, yeah, it does. In that instance, usually, I mean, if you get this two week job, it depends kind of on what time of the year it is, because obviously interpreting is very seasonal. Um, so if it's like, if season is in full swing and you get a two week job offered, it's sort of kind of a question as to whether or not you want to take it because you might, out of those so it's like, what, like 10 working days? Out of those 10 working days, you might already be booked like five days. You know it's the season, so you know you're probably going to get the other five days booked as well, but you can be at home. You have like different jobs. It's less boring than doing the same job for two <laughs> weeks straight. Um, so it's kind of like a consideration as to whether or not you want to take it. And most of the time, these longer jobs, you actually kind of break them down and simply split them, split them up because it's easier to like remove yourself from your home market for one week than for two straight weeks. Um, mm. I in the automotive industry, like that happens a, 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 a fair amount. I would say to get these like longer stretch assignments, they usually come at quite opportune times. So I had like this three week job in like South Africa, which was in December, and cool. so December oh is wow. you know yeah that was really cool. But <laughs> December is I wouldn't say like the, the quiet season, but it's like quieting down. You know, whereas had it been in like October. I'm not sure I would have taken the job because I would have missed out on like literal three weeks of work in Munich. Mm-hmm. So mm, um, 
And the upside is too, but it's like the same for you guys, right? Like if you can't make it, like you give it to Eve and vice versa. So the upside is obviously if I can make a job, like I can make two other colleagues very, very happy and then I'm going to get something back in return eventually. So it's kind of mm-hmm. like the give and take of it all. Right, but, right. Yeah. I think, I mean, I've, I'm in the, the British market, which outside of a few bits of London is a lot less busy than the German market. Um, and so I've <laughs> never had... I have had where I've quoted for two jobs that were on at the same time and neither of them came, of them came through. What's mm. more difficult for me is where, because I do interpreting and I do research because in the UK market, most almost all interpreters that I know in the UK have to do interpreting and. Uh, interpreting mm. Mm. and translation, interpreting and teaching, interpreting and for me research and writing. Um, what I find more difficult and I've had that a couple of times is where so if I'm writing say for for, uh, an article for a magazine there is a hard deadline that is non-negotiable more than once I've had to go to an interpreting job realizing that some of the time that I would normally use you know at the end of day one to prepare for day two I'm going to have to somehow condense my day two prep because you know uh, the editor of the ITI bulletin needs the article on her desk by Tuesday yeah, and there is no mm, negotiation, gotcha. no negotiation there at all, um, and so that's that becomes challenging at the moment. The good thing is, is that all the projects I have are relatively flexible. But I do have a project, a research project at the moment, where there are certain days that I have to be on university campus for, and that's non-negotiable. But the good thing is, is because of the kind of project it is, and because I'm a contractor and not staff, I we set those days together in the team. And so I know three weeks in advance, you know, this is the day I'm going to be in university. And so, I, you know, you work around it. Um, I've not, that job hasn't clashed with interpreting yet. But, you know, it's, it is making the choice as well. And also things like I, one of my most recent interpreting jobs was quite a late finish. And I realized that, you know, if I do this interpreting job, which finishes at this part of Scotland at, I think it was like 10 o'clock at night, for me to get home on public transport, I got a lift because so I was home an hour earlier, but I would likely not be home until midnight. Hmm. If I'm not home until midnight, hmm. the likelihood is I won't be in a fit state to you know, do a nine o'clock the next morning. Mm-hmm. So you, you, I then had to juggle, you know, I've got this interpreting job, which is really well paid because the client thinks it's hard. It was actually one of the easier ones. Um, you know, I have this interpreting job, which means I'm going to get home at midnight. So I then have to schedule the next day to fit with that. Um, and that becomes more difficult for me. And then you've got family things that you have and, and so on. So that that becomes the more difficult part. And I'm realizing now that if I were to go back to doing translation a lot, it would be very, very complicated now. I mm. actually I actually mm. said mm. no to a client, not because, you know, the, the rates weren't, I didn't massively hate or love the work. But the when the work was coming in was always because of their seasonality conflicting with the other projects that I needed to do. Mm-hmm. And so I, the the end up for me was I had to say to that client, that translation client, I'm really sorry, you know, thank you for being so loyal for all these years, but because of when the work's coming, I'm just not being able to to do it. And mm-hmm. so I said I said yeah. no to a long term client. It was a wrench. You know, you go back in your accounts and say how much did each client give you every year and, and you realize that's an amount of cash you have to find again. But we have to be sensible. We're human beings. And I'm very aware now that I have four young kids. I should only be doing a four-day week. And that means that everything has to fit into four days, whether it wants to or not. I just have to make it. Listen, guys, um, we, we've been going for, for quite a while. We actually have quite a few more topics, but maybe we can um, take up the thread another day. I don't know how you how you feel about that. Um, maybe sure. talk a little bit yeah, more about technology great. and stuff. Yeah, that'd be fun. I have, I have... And you have dishes to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Usually I would do them during the day, but I've been out all day book writing. Yeah. And yeah, the, the National Library was good, but I keep thinking, you know, the National Library will have no distractions. It's the biggest library in the country, Jonathan. Of course it has distractions. <laughs> Lots of good books. <laughs> exactly. 20, between 28 and 29 million books, according to the library, and I was chatting to today. 
In in any case, it's it's been really great talking to you, um, and it's always a big pleasure to to listen to your podcast. And even though it's called Thoughts on Translation, I would recommend that uh, interpreters check it out as well because I've learned a ton just by listening to you too. So it's been great putting the two podcasts together. Thank, Thank you so much for the great questions and for inviting us. Same to you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you guys so much for stepping in. <laughs> bye bye. Maybe the next time you two should write the introductions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could do that. We'll yeah. trade off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think it's great if we just keep the conversation going, not just the yeah. one, two, three, four, five of us, but also um, the translation and interpretation community in general. I think that would be the good. Spaces. You didn't see interpreting space, did you, Alex? I just no, did. I, I, did. I, did. I, I deliberately did. did not I say did. that. I hate that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Do, do translators call it the translation space? No. 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 You guys can make that a thing. Like not even for fun. Yeah. <laughs> for the first time in all, the history translators are more sane than interpreters. That's never happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because we have a Jonathan and they don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys should see his face now. I see it. I see it. <laughs> <laughs>